listeners, welcome to today's episode all about parasites. And I'm so excited to introduce to you my very good friend, Dr. Marisol. She is queen of the thrones and she is amazing. You are in for a treat and lots of fun. Welcome, Dr. Marisol. Well, hello, Chantal. Thanks for having me again. I love these little chats we get to have. (laughs) So let's talk a little bit about kind of the top three parasites that you, a lot of clients have come to see you for. And actually before that, I'd like you to tell, tell listeners a little bit about yourself before. we Yeah. Yeah. So I've been in the natural health industry for greater than 20 years at this point. And I started my career, um, truly out of a need and a necessity because my health was in such a, a, bad space. My digestive tract was off. I was constantly dealing with IBS. I also was feeling very disconnected from not only the world, but what I was doing in life and actually ultimately God as well too. And I needed to, I was looking and searching for answers and I found my pathway through natural health, going to naturopathic school. And then of course, you know, push comes to shove, we get back and learn what are the true, what is, what the true meaning of connection is. So, so now what I do is I have a clinical practice and, but from my clinical practice, I've springboarded to actually teaching people around the world, all about their digestive health and their guts and how they poo and all the love letters and the messages that our body is saying to us about our health in general. So I'm the host of the Pearls of Practice um, online series, which is every week, as well as the creator of the Queen of the Thrones uh, product line, which helped people to achieve those goals in getting their gut health back. Mm, Awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about the top three parasites that you kind of see the most right now. Yeah, the biggest one is, uh, you know, in our pediatric population is pinworms. Those those are typical classic, you know, kids, whenever they touch themselves, they can spread them to all their friends. And those are often the cases when like little kids come in and they're having like irritation around the bum or they're waking up in the middle of the night. That's really, really common. The other one that we tend to see a lot is uh, roundworms. uh, And we'll actually visualize them many times in our colon hydrotherapy systems, which are is pretty impressive. Uh, basically, it's a system that you know flushes water up the, the intestine and it cleans out the intestine. And so oftentimes you'll see strands of worms that could that come out of these, these, these colon hydrotherapy sessions. The other thing that is quite common actually is tapeworms. And these are often more self-reported that patients have eliminated them out in the bathroom. But there's been an occasion when we've actually tested them. We've done the parasite and OBA test the proper way, which is, um, I'll speak about that in a moment, uh, and we'll actually identify them. The reason I say the testing needs to be done proper is because when you're dealing with parasites, it's a very specific way of testing. Uh, oftentimes, doctors will only test one uh, stool sample, one ova and parasite stool sample. But to actually get a true measure and to really find out whether or not there are parasites, and it doesn't always give you the true answer, you actually need to do it three times consecutively. And you need to give yourself something to actually create a laxative effect so that you can clear out your intestine. So what we often do with patients is we'll actually have them do colon hydrotherapy sessions before we actually even test them for their parasites. So then we'll give them also an oral laxative. Sometimes it'll be a magnesium or it could be a castor oil, which is one of my favorite oral laxatives. We'll have them take that and then collect three samples in order to get the proper testing of it. Oh, and there is one more parasite we see a lot, which is Giardia. And Giardia is often passed around from uh, vacations in tropical countries. Mm. Yeah. So let's start with pinworms. I know that kids are a big one, but the, the big thing is that people need to know for pinworms is... If your child has it, most likely your whole family has it. Yeah, yeah. It it is so contagious. It spreads so quickly. Children, you know, of course, they don't have the best, you know, sanitary practices, washing their hands. They'll go to the bathroom, they'll wipe, or they'll they'll scratch themselves, especially at night. Because the 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 key classic sign with the pinworms is that they actually come out of the anus at night and they they they're very irritating to the entire like butt butt region, right? The, The the butt region for the child. So the child will be itching and 
scratching and touch their face and touch everything. And, you know, that's how you can see them. Oftentimes what we ask moms and dads to do is to put a piece of tape in the bum, <laughs> literally on the anus. And then we ask them to bring back that tape and we look at the tape underneath of a microscope and there we can see the eggs and, and the pinworms many times stuck in the tape because the reason the pinworms come out is to actually lay the eggs on the outside of the anus. Mm. Not a pretty picture, but that's the reality with parasites, <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, look, I have a question on this that I yeah. want to And the question is, this is from Rianne. And ah. she says that her child has pinworms and she tried the Reese's pinworm. Yeah. And it, she's tried that a couple of times and it hasn't gone away. The whole family has taken it. And now there's... Um, the doctor wants to do mabendazole and albendazole as a prescription drug. And the prescription drug yeah. is like a thousand dollars. Oh, wow. A yeah. couple of pills. Have you seen results with the, you know, prescription drugs and what have you seen with that? Absolutely. 100%. I've seen results with them. Is it the only way that you want to go? Probably not, especially if they are so expensive. The, the reason why they are so effective is that they do actually kill off the parasites. I was in Nicaragua and it wasn't pinworm, but I was dealing with Giardia and I absolutely needed to take it because I was having very damaging diarrhea constantly. And I couldn't, I couldn't leave the, the house that I was at. So I actually had to take the medicine. But what occurs is this, is that it will have an effect in the body, in the digestive tract. Are there secondary side effects? There, there is with absolutely everything. It completely will affect your digestive tract. But the biggest thing is that the pinworms, pinworms will just come back unless some more groundwork has been done. So we actually need to do groundwork in terms of improving the immune system and the gut mucosal membrane in order to prevent future episodes of parasites because they'll just begin again and again. That, that, and I think that is the, the biggest key with parasites is that you know so many of us actually are walking around with parasites, many of us. And the, if we only take the drugs that re reduce them, we'll just keep on getting infested with parasites again and again and again. It's just the, the so natural. So let's say, let's <laughs> say, you know, they've tried the Reese's pinworm. This yeah. Man. She tried the Reese's pinworm. Let's just say she gives in and takes the, you know, the membendazole or the albendazole. Yep. Now you're saying what are some things she could do? Let's say if she doesn't, let's say she doesn't have the money to spend the thousand. Yeah. What does she need to do at this point? And then if she doesn't, or if she does do the memendazole, what I'm hearing you say is there's have still things that she, there's support that she needs to do to fix that. What are some of those? Yeah. So the, the very most important thing is fixing and working with the innate immune system. So that's the whole, um, you know, the digestive tract as well as the uh, outline outside lining. So basic supplementation is super important. We always like to have patients on things like probiotics, um, alkalinizing agents that are taken at the same time as a probiotic, because that is extremely powerful. You take it during fasting in the morning on first waking and at night before going to bed, because when you combine probiotics with alkalinizing agents, Number one, you get better uh, seeding of the probiotics that you're taking. But number two, you're shifting the pH balance of the intestine. So many of the reasons why people actually will preserve their parasite load or even bad bacterial load or bad yeast load is simply because their acid-based balance in their system isn't functioning optimally. Because if your digestive tract was the proper pH, you would have a less invasion of these un unhappy microbes or bacteria or parasites. So it's it's kind of across the globe. So that's one of the most important things I think is, is super valuable. The other thing is using- Okay, wait, I want to ask you a couple questions about yeah. that. Uh -huh. So what is it that you recommend that someone takes? Mm. So you said the probiotic. Do you have like a probiotic that you love and you say- I don't have one in specific because like, we compound ours specifically in clinic. So a, a general probiotic without- um, FOSs is very important. FOSs are fructooligosaccharides. Fructooligosaccharides happen to create more irritation, especially if you already are having 
problems with, with infection in your gut. So you want to avoid fructooligosaccharides in your probiotic formula. So you're just looking for a probiotic formula. Ideally, it has Infantis strain, the Bifido Infantis strain, because that is an initial populating bacterial um, a probiotic for the body, for the gut. And it's actually a very effective, especially in childhood diseases like pinworm, if you have that Infantis strain, which is what people should be looking for. Hey guys, I wanted to tell you I'm offering a free weight loss virtual Bible study. Now is the perfect time to focus on understanding true hunger and fullness and learn what the Bible has to say about it. All you have to do is go to ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study. After you sign up, you'll receive a six week Bible study video that you can watch on your own or you can get a small group of people and do it together. That's ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study for your free six week Bible study course. Now, when you say you created in clinic, what does that mean? Yeah, so we actually have a compounding pharmacy that we work with and we make very very patient-specific probiotics. So depending on what they have, we adjust the different strains of bacteria that we put into their probiotic. Because every, pro- that's, and that's why I say if people aren't following with a practitioner to really look for a generalized probiotic that just does not contain FOSs. Because, you know, every probiotic strain actually works differently. Like it, every probiotic strain has its own little, you know, tweaking that it does to the immune system, its own tweaking that it does to the mucosal membrane. It's very, very, very specific. So you just, so in the absence of having that knowledge or being guided by somebody who does have that knowledge, the best way to do it is to get a general uh, strain probiotic without FOSs. That's always my biggest recommendation. So when, so you can, Someone can't buy that from you unless they come see you at clinic. Right, exactly. Yeah, they do because it is it is basically like a prescription. But there are very good companies out there like, you know, Designs for Health has very good probiotics that I really enjoy. Um, my, uh, micro, por, uh, spor, spor Biome, I forget the name of it in the States, but that's also a very good company. There's a, quite a few good companies that have excellent probiotics. And again, DFH is a simple one that is very highly available in many different places. But aren't you authorized now to see everyone through telemed? So like, couldn't you, like if someone right now, yeah. like someone says, I want to go see Dr. Marisol. Great can- question. Um, in Canada, unfortunately not. It's not that way. We can see people who uh, who live in Ontario and the, the province or state of Ontario. Uh, and we, if we feel that we actually need to see them in person in order to get a true understanding of their case, and that is something that will prevent us from being able to treat them. So unfortunately, our laws haven't been as relaxed or haven't been uh, relaxed as others have, which would be great. Um, maybe that is coming in sometime soon, but not for the moment. However, you know, that being said, my mission now at this point in my life is to be online to teach people because there's so much that we can do at home alone without even seeing the practitioner, honestly. And it, it is those small health practices that is my true goal with te- of teaching people. And if they want to get uh, that intimate experience, what they can do is uh, watch my Pearls of Practice episodes every week. And every week we go through a different, you know, important subject and we talk about what to do and these different things and basically helping people to have their own life library of information that will help them to manage and practice their health in the best way possible. So if someone wanted to get the pearls of practice, Mm -hmm. um, is that on a podcast platform or how do they get in on that? Is that just like a webinar that you're doing? Yeah, exactly. So you go onto my website and we have a pop-up that the, the, on the first page of our website, drmarisol.com and also on our Instagram at queen of the thrones on Facebook, every post that we post, we basically provide a link to the webinar. So we've been doing them every Sunday night at 8 PM and it, Eastern time. That is at 5 PM Pacific time. We will a time change possibly, but for now, this time works really, really well. And we kind of like it because it's Sunday night. It's really cozy. Um, What else are you going to do on a Sunday night, right? Grab a glass of wine, put on your casserole pack and come watch the show. So it just, it gives people again, these tips because, you know, ultimately even things like improving your, your innate immune system and your mucosal membrane, those things take time. And there's lots of little factors and lots of little steps. Of course, you know, a quick fix of things like probiotics and alkalinizing agents, um, Castoral pox is the other thing that I always recommend, especially with any type of parasite problem. And in pinworms in specific, I actually recommend people to rub castor oil specifically around the anus because this helps with actually like, like 
did da- like damaging the, pro- the, the parasites and getting rid of them and getting rid of the eggs and all of those things, right? Because it changes the environment. It breaks down biofilm, which is where, you know, parasites live happily in the gut. So these, these are the tools that are the best that people can start at home, right? And, and, you know, have a doctor because if you do need a drug, because if it's not resolving it, sometimes there's, there's no bad drug there's only bad time and place for for drugs, right? So if you've been trying different things and they're not working, you sometimes need to bring in those big, big guns that are the drugs in order to get rid of the infestation. Cause sometimes the load of the parasite can be just so great that it's just overwhelming and, and natural things won't be enough. Now, have you seen any patients that have had, um, mucus in their, like poop or mucus just coming out of their anus as a side effect of parasites. Yeah. And, and more so even still is from taking the different drugs that kill off parasites. So we'll notice more of the mucus oftentimes see mucus is always in reaction to inflammation and irritation and some type of an immune response. So when there are parasites in the system, what we're eliciting is what's known as an IgE response. It's like a, an allergic response actually is what's key. People, if they have parasites, will often find that they're having more allergies than normal. This is a very, very, very big sign of parasites. So because of that, mucus increase can increase, will be, will be seen, but you'll see it even more on actually treating the parasites so that you'll actually, because, because it's the weight of the body tries to shed off the internal lining, which is where the parasites are being hosted in the system. Mm. Really okay. Question. So we've, we've got off topic because I wanted to talk, yes. to you to talk a little bit more about, talk about the acidity. Yes. In your gut. And so you said the two things you recommend, you said is parasites and then finding a way to get your body into a more alkaline state. Right. Um, what, what is your opinion on that? So alkalinity and acidity is, you know, the, reg- the the basic function of the body. The body is always trying to be of a proper pH in the blood, in the tissues, in the digestive tract. It is all very set up very, very religiously, right? Like it is, there is a way to do this. This is a natural law that must be followed. And when P, when there, there are pH problems, the issue is this is that the digestive tract always is the one that takes the burden for pH problems in the blood or in the tissues. Because the gut can survive in improper pHs, but the blood can't. If the blood is an improper pH, it's, it's, you know, goodbye, Charlie. And if your tissues are of the improper pH, it's the same issue. The tissues can withstand it a little bit longer because they have the mechanism of inflammation, which also can adjust the pH. But it ultimately, the blood regulates all everything downstream. So, so if the gut isn't doing well, from pH, what we have to do is start getting, giving the body alkalinizing agents orally. And, and alkalinizing agents usually look like a formula that is highly mineralized. You'll see things like calcium, magnesium, uh, potassium. They'll often be like a potassium bicarbonate. You're looking for some kind of a something bicarbonate in that formula. There needs to be a bicarbonate in order to have that alkalinity effect. Old school practitioners used to actually even have people just take like a half of a teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate, literally like what you cook with, as a way to alkalinize the tissue mixed in water. And this is this is also very valid. You need to be careful not to get a sodium bicarbonate that may have aluminum in it because certain ones are manufactured with aluminum. And again, you can see that on the label. I mean, I've seen this mostly actually in the States when I've gone to the grocery stores, I'll see a lot of sodium bicarbonates with aluminum. And so those are the ones you want to be careful of. You want to get the aluminum free sodium bicarbonate. And that is a way that you can do alkalinization. You still do want to take things like calcium, magnesium, potassium, because those are all the minerals that that aid in overall dissemination of and balancing of of alkalinity and acidity within the system. And so what's your favorite alkaline, alkaline, uh, alkaline, alkalinization So I really enjoy something known as electrolyte synergy from DFH. It's probably one of my favorites. They do really truly have a a nice balance of potassium bicarbonate. There's also some vitamin C in there, some quercetin. Quercetin has an effect to improve the gastric mucosa. So there's a lot of really good benefits outside of only just alkalinization in that electrolyte synergy from DFH. Mm, Gotcha. Yeah, Yeah, it's a really good formula. So talk a little bit 
about um, the castor oil pack for people who don't know what that is and show people how to use it. And is there ever a time that they're going to take the castor oil orally or you suggest always doing it in the pack? Sounds good. So Castor oil pack is one of the eight most ancient therapies. You know, Hippocrates would use it, Cleopatra. I mean, the, the list goes on and on of famous doctors. Pliny the Elder, who was a, a medicine man to the Roman emperors. We had the traditional Chinese medicine doctors to the, you know, emperors of the dynasties who would work with castor oil for joint pain and inflammation. Ayurvedic medicine, the Indian uh, form of practice, had castor oil always as a staple for any type of digestive problems. So castor oil was reinvigorated in North American medicine, holistic and alternative at the turn of the century in 1900s um, by a famed bedside healer known as Edgar Cayce. And what Edgar Cayce was said to have been doing was to actually intuit um, information about these castor oil packs. And he was, he was actually very, um, very spiritual, very biblical. He read the King James version of the Bible every single year for his entire life. Very interesting. And many say that castor oil actually is the oil of God or the, it's the palm of Christ. It's actually the secondary name uh, for castor oil, which is, is a beautiful beautiful connotation. They say that even potentially there might, there might be uh, some reason to say that some of the oils that were used in to anoint the sick that Jesus Christ was anointing the sick with were castor oil. Now, can I find the validity on that? I can't. So I, I don't want to comment too much about it, but you know, I have no, no doubt because castor oil has been around for such a long time within our society. So have olive oil, so have sesame oil, so have all these wonderful oils. Oil, the, the thing that separates castor oil from these other wonderful oils is that castor oil is a molecular structure that can actually go deep into the into the dermis and into the tissues most oils whether you're using jojoba or vitamin e or almond oil safe as a carrier oil for your essential oils these oils only stay topically on the skin and don't go deep into the dermis and this has to do with a lot of a number one, the, the chemical structure of, of castor oil, but also because of the molecular weight of, of one of the ingredients of castor oil. So when you put castor oil on, it actually goes deep into the tissues and goes into the circulation. And when you're doing what's known as a castor oil pack, which is basically you take an organic cotton flannel. This is my queen of the thrones pack. This is actually the pack that I've been using the past evenings. I thought I would bring a, ni a nice used one. Uh, you apply two tablespoons of castor oil the first time you use it, the second time you use it, you use only one, one tablespoon, and then you apply it directly onto your liver area. So you would put it right here and you would wrap it up and tie it onto your body. Very much like my little model over here, as you can see that castor oil on, on their liver. You ideally wear it overnight to bed, or the alternative is to wear it for at least one hour. The oil will seep into the tissues, into the body, and it's a way to work at healing the gut from the outside in. Because a major problem with people who have problems with digestion, whether it's IBS, whether it's parasites, Crohn's, colitis, any of the digestive disturbances or problems, bad gas, constipation, anything, what happens is this, is that many of us are constantly only treating from the inside, right? And the key thing is that we have problems with absorption, problems with that membrane working well. So in order to actually get resolution and get your gut working in a better function, you have to treat it not only from the inside, but you need to go from the outside inwards. And this is where castor oil packs really truly have their best place in medicine is that they keep the gut in good shape. And they also uh, create the foundation for health and healing because they do so many things, including, you know, improving the function of how you digest, how you absorb and how you eliminate food. It also provides you antioxidants. You know, vitamin E is very high in castor oil. It, there aren't very many oils that are actually very elevated in, in, in vitamin E outside of almond oil, right? Other oils like olive oil, they don't really have very elevated levels of vitamin E. Castor oil recycles glutathione, which is a very important molecule when it comes to detoxification and cleansing. Castor oil and one of its effects on effects on biofilm, yeast overgrowth, and parasites is that castor oil actually stimulates production of nitric oxide. 
And nitric oxide is a very powerful molecule that we create in our body that is effective against all of these problems of infection in our system, right? So there's there, and then on top of that, you know, it's an inflammation regulator. So if there's inflammation in the gut, it'll balance out the inflammation. If there is stress in the system, which we all have stress, castor oil packs, when you put them on your body, actually stimulate the oxytocin hormone. And oxytocin hormone is the regulating hormone to cortisol, which is that stress hormone. And the other side benefit to oxytocin is it's a love and connection molecule. So for me, one of my core issues and problems in my health was that, and why I was suffering with so much IBS was that I felt always a lack of connection. So it was that my body was in a constant stress state and I didn't produce very much oxytocin. And by doing the castor oil packs, that was one of the way that my body was able to understand that the oxytocin balance between cortisol. And so then I started doing them religiously. And when you do anything religiously, what happens when it becomes a practice, you actually, it's, it becomes ingrained in your body and your body's metabolism can actually start to replicate that easier. Right. But you must maintain the practice. Like there's, there's no two, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You have to be practicing everything from, you know, like practicing scripture or practicing the Bible or practicing good eating habits or practicing exercise. You have to practice castor oil packs to get all these benefits. And then finally, its effect on the microbiome and how it resets the microbiome, improves the balance of good bacteria versus bad bacteria, and helps with breakdown of an unhealthy biofilm. And for those who don't know what a biofilm is, biofilm is a mechanism of action that bacteria, you know, invasive bacteria, invasive yeasts, parasites, they live within a biofilm that isn't healthy, that is difficult to then attack the bad bacteria, the bad yeast, and the bad parasites and get them out of the system. Hey guys, one of the things that will take your weight loss to the next level is coaching. You can either work one-on-one -on -one with me or one of our certified private coaches. If you'd like, you can schedule your free call. It's a 10 minute strategy call just to see if coaching is gonna really take you to the next level. The other thing is listening to the audiobook. Listening to the audiobook and getting the video course that I've done, people are seeing dramatic results. If you just listen to the audiobook 30 minutes a day, over and over and over again, and get the video course. Go to ChantelRayway.com and check out the video course. You won't be sorry you did. So if you're watching this, if you're listening to this and not watching it, this would be great for you to be watching it as well because it's nice to watch mm -hmm. exactly how she's putting it over top of the liver. But I wanted yes. to ask you about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, yes. um, N-A-F-L-D. Um, and for those of you who don't know what it is, but it's basically a liver condition affecting people who drink little to no alcohol. But the, the main characteristic of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is that there's too much fat stored in the liver. Now, can the castor oil pack help with you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or so have you they done any research on that? I've had done much personal research. In fact, when I was 26 years old, see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is stemmed by insulin resistance and blood sugar and problems with that in your system. And I come from two diabetic parents. Like, so I, you know, blood sugar was an issue automatically, genetically. What at 26, I was really fearful. I was dealing with PCOS, again, another manifestation of a younger version of a diabetes, right? It's already a metabolic syndrome in the making. And I was diagnosed with fatty liver disease and I couldn't understand it. I wasn't a doctor at the time and I, it just didn't connect. I'm like, I'm not drinking. Why is my liver impacted? How can this be? But now at 42, I have no more alcoholic no, no more non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So my liver is in perfect health. And there's actually reports and studies outside of, of course, my personal experience where, you know, castor oil packs are used to reduce uh, liver enzymes and, and inflammatory processes that cause inflammation and cause damage. And that ultimately too, not, not only is it the insulin and the sugar creating damage in the liver, but it's also inflammation because sugar always causes inflammation in the body. It creates advanced glycolization and products that are incredibly inflammatory inflammatory and incredibly damaging. They're like a, a reactive oxygen species, or they're like a, 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 a basically a fireball that, that can cause damage in any tissue. And of course, you know, 
well, the, the liver is very much impacted by things with sh- having to do with sugar and insulin. So castor oil packs are really beneficial. And it goes back to just those basic mechanisms that are in action with the pack, the foundational actions, the fact that it, it regulates and helps with glutathione production, the fact that it reduces inflammation, the fact that it improves the microbiome. The microbiome is a source of inflammation if it's unhealthy right? If you have parasites in your system, well, then your microbiome is definitely going to be dysregulated. You will have a lot of inflammation systemically all coming from your gut because you have this irritant, a constant irritant there. And then the inflammation is in your gut, but then it goes to the rest of the organs in your system, including your liver, including your brain, including everything, joints, wherever it manifests for you just depends on your susceptibility genetically. Yeah. And one of the things I love about your castor oil pack uh, bundle that you guys do is two things. Number one, it's organic. It's an organic cotton compress. And I don't think people realize, but most of the ones that I've seen, they're wool. So Mm. they're not with organic cotton. They're this itchy wool. That's like, oh my gosh, you'll just sit there and itch yourself to death. Yeah. Second is that it's, it's a hundred percent organic castor oil. Mm -hmm. And it comes in a glass Glass. bottle, not in a plastic. Can you talk about that first? Yeah, so very important, these points, you know, because as I said earlier, a castor oil is the ultimate carrier oil. So it carries everything. And if it is placed in a plastic bottle, the unfortunate thing is that it will carry plastic into your system and you're going to have a negation of the effect of the beneficial effects that you're looking for. When it you know, this is so important. And it also, it also transcends to all the other oils that we are purchasing and buying for our diet. If, if, if cost is an issue and there is only, you know, one form of food that you can buy organic, let it be your oils. Oils are healing. They're anointing oils. They're, they're the absolutely, they're the most healing of substances. So oils must always be an organic and any edible oil or topical oil or oil that you're using therapeutically should always be in a glass bottle and should always be in a dark glass bottle as well too, to prevent any oxidation or problems with them. It is that I speak about this incessantly about castor oil and other oils all being in glass because otherwise it's, you may as well not take them or use them because they're just not good for your body. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk more about the mucus in the stool because I've, Mm. I've seen question upon question about this is that Mm -hmm. people are saying, you know, when they go online, there's different things, you know, they don't know if they have Crohn's disease. They don't know if they have IBS. They don't know if it's ulcerative colon colitis, colitis. Um, you know, is it a bacterial effect infection or is it parasites? Um, and so, so how, first of all, when you're looking, like if someone poops and they want to like look at their, their poop, mm-hmm. is the mucus in the stool is normal, but it's, is it visible? And like, will you be able to like, look at your, your poop and say, up oh, there's music, mucus there. Or are these people talking about mucus that's literally just coming out of their rectum? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of scenarios. Hidden mucus, you're going to notice when you wipe your bum. So you'll be what we're, what's called a hyper wiper. So you'll have signs of mucus, but it won't be excessive. Ideally, when people are wiping their bums, they should wipe once and they should wipe clean. And then you know that your mucus levels are normal. There's not, not an issue with major inflammation or allergies or parasites or anything like that. The other case scenario that I believe people are thinking about when they're, when they're talking about mucus and their stools associated with parasites is this. I have had many a patient bring me samples of what they thought was a worm, uh, which, you know, looks like an elongation of fibrous substance. So for all intents and purposes, it absolutely could be a worm or a tapeworm or something, but we, um, when you examine it under the microscope, which we have in clinic, it isn't a worm. It is just simply like fibrous, fibrous uh, tissue. It's actually more, it's like the, the mucosal membrane regenerates of the digestive tract. And all that that simply is, is a shedding that occurs from time to time. And that shedding can often occur when you're taking things to clean up a digestive tract, or if you're taking thing, or if you have just an over, severe overload, your body will naturally begin to shed the internal mucus lining to help with clearing out of the infections. This can actually happen. So people will actually see like sometimes globs coming out. When 
when we have patients do colon hydrotherapy, it's very, very common after they do the treatment that they go to the bathroom and they find like white masses just coming out of, of the rectum. And again, that is just shedding of a layer that is unhealthy, no different than, you know, on our skin, we shed our skin all the time. And the gut is the same embryonic tissue as, as the skin. So it does the, it responds in exactly that same manner. Mm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the hydrotherapy for the colon. Um, And how often do you think you should do it? Um, And talk about the benefits. I love colon colon hydrotherapy. To me, it is one of the best treatments. It actually also has roots biblical um, that they, the, what they used to do back in the day was that they would take a, a sugar cane, a gourd, fill the gourd with water and use a sugar cane as a tube and insert it into the anus and into the rectum and allow with gravity, the water to enter and then, and the insides to be eliminated. I like to think of it as, you know, cleanliness being next to godliness. And, you know, we shower hopefully every day or two. So why are we never cleaning our insides, right? To me, I believe they're incredibly beneficial. I usually recommend, I I do them myself personally weekly. Now that's very easy because I have easy access. I have my clinic. So it's very simple for me to go. But in the absence of that and, and that type of access, what I usually recommend to people is to start by doing once a week for four to six weeks, up to eight weeks and see what happens and then drop it down to a maintenance of once every two weeks for a couple months and then down to once a month and maintain on once a month until the next season of cleaning, which is, is oftentimes in the spring. Spring is always such a good time to like let go and to shed and to clean. So if people are looking to do big cleanses. I often say do them in the spring and do them in the fall. Those are the best two times. The other time I really enjoy doing that as well is January, just because January is such a a new beginning, a new year, a new start, right? So there, there's just that energy. In the new air. year, new you, right? Yeah, exactly. New year, new you. Exactly. So it's just a good time, right? Because mentally you're already kind of thinking that you're like, you know, who am I going to be in this new year? So, you know, it's a great way to start a cleanse. So in September, in January, and then of course in April, May, just excellent time. Like it's just a perfect time to really do a cleanse. And, and it doesn't need to be complicated. You know, you can do these cleanses with like you castor oil packs, a, a simple supplement regime, and then just get, uh, get into a nice clinic, uh, clinical practice or a, a clinician that has colon hydrotherapy and start booking those treatments. Cause they really are foundationally, they f- make you feel better. Like number one, you always feel lighter. Number two, one of the biggest actions of colon hydrotherapy that it's known for is just to hydrate your colon. There are so many people who are are so dehydrated in their colon and its ability to balance itself well. This is partly because of acidity, uh, but basic balance in the system, electrolyte shifts that aren't aren't going properly, um, burden of bacteria, burden of yeast, burden of a variety of different things. So just even cleaning and hydrating that colon can really set you up for good health. So it's such a simple practice and it's so easy. And the thing that I love most about colon hydrotherapy is that compared to enemas, you know, many people practice enemas to go to the bathroom regularly. A colon hydrotherapy is equivalent to 20 enemas. So you can imagine, right? What is your opinion about coffee enemas? You know, coffee enemas, I've been hearing about herb enemas and coffee enemas that basically where you take herbs and like take it into the water and kind of let them steep, I guess, to kind of get things moving more and coffee enemas. What is your take on those? So coffee enemas have shown some in some uh, clinics that have been researching the coffee enemas that for long-term use of coffee enemas can actually cause a re- very relaxed colon and a colon that can actually enlarge and, and, and hold the stools more instead of eliminating them and evacuating them. And whether it would, this, the same effect doesn't happen with things like herb enemas or chlorophyll enemas or anything like that, it, it potentially, hypoth- hypothetically, could be the effect of the caffeine on the intestine, causing an irritation or a problem and just like over relaxing or that the receptors don't function the way that they used to because of the, ca- the, co- the coffee effect, right? It's caffeine. I, I have never been a big uh, promoter of coffee enemas, 
be only because for me, uh, I have an extremely high sensitivity to caffeine and caffeinated products so that when I do have them, they very much affect my system. So I never worked with the, ca- the coffee enemas. So I never, never worked or promoted them very much, but I have many friends who use them quite a bit and have good benefit with their patients. So I think everything in moderation, when it comes to coffee enemas, I wouldn't be making a daily practice of it. I think I would be putting it on as a routine. You also don't want to be doing enemas every day unless there's a mechanical reason why or colon hydrotherapies every day. Again, that can be Every day can be for a period of time that is fine, but not constantly and not long term because then you just get into you just get into into issues with it, right? So that is that is the key. So you want you want to be you want to use the enemas but safely and not in overabundance. Hey guys, I want to tell you about a great product that you absolutely cannot live without, and it's called Digest Aid. When you're stressed, you might not be able to produce as much stomach acid. And if you're eating a little more right now and you're stressed, you need help to digest your food. My digest aid that I created has enzymes that are capable of doing just that. It has both betaine HCL, not just HCL, but an enzyme pepsin that helps your body digest your food, which is really unique. And right now, all of our products are 30% off. Go to ChantelRayWay.com, click on store and get yours for 30% off. Just use the promo code podcast. So we've been talking a lot about acidity, like in your gut. And um, I want to talk about skin issues for just a second. So for me personally, you know, I have a little bit of eczema here and on my scalp. And um, for me, one of the things I've been noticing, and I can't a hundred percent put my handle on it, but I do love to have like citrus. Like I take like a lot of, I'll have water with a little bit of um, orange juice or lemon or lime. And one of the things I'm starting to figure out is that the more citrus I'm taking, my skin starts breaking out. And I'm wondering if that has to do with the acidity in my gut. And I wanted you to talk about just skin issues with parasites in general. Yeah. So this is the neat thing about this. So citrus actually uh, is very good. It's ironic because it's an acid. So you'd think that the acid would cause more acidity in your gut. It actually does the opposite. The citric citrix actually create more alkalinization in the gut. It's just the, the whole balancing of the pH throughout the body and how it works. What citrus is very highly known for is being a very strong sensitivity for people. And it's, an, it's more than likely with skin conditions, it's more of a sensitivity rather than it affecting the acid and base base balance. Although that being said, if it's a high, if it's a sensitivity, when something is a sensitivity, it can, can create more inflammation. And when you have more inflammation in the system, then you have more acidity via that mechanism of action, if that makes sense. Yeah. Now your secondary question was about, remind me, you wanted to know. Skincare, like, right. That like a symptom. Like if someone says, look, I'm having massive rashes on my body or you know, not just regular old psoriasis, but, but well, that's a good question is, is, have you seen it where people have gotten rid of the parasites and gotten rid of psoriasis or gotten rid of rashes or hives or just because the, the skin detoxes. So. Yeah. And it's much more than that. It's actually the immune mechanistic response because the, the parasites really trigger immune uh, activity in your body. And sometimes it can skew your immune system and it can bring on autoimmune conditions. Uh, no different than viruses can do the same thing too. Like uh, certain viruses can, are like Epstein-Barr virus. The one that's known for mononucleosis is, is known to have a link to multiple sclerosis to MS, right? There's, there's so many different cases of this within the literature, but also parasites have been known to do this as well too and trigger immune fun- functionality problems. And the skin is often the brunt of the immune system because the skin is a protective mechanistic barrier of the innate immune system, very similar to the gut. They are like from the same embryonic tissues. They respond the same. They both have large immune systems. So that if you are dealing with an immune system tweaking because of a parasite, then absolutely it could stimulate a a psoriasis. It could stimulate eczema. It could stimulate any of the dermatological problems. And with resolution of the parasites, you can also have an improvement of those skin conditions and that immune dysregulation. Awesome. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. Tell people where they can find you and where they can follow you. 
Absolutely. So you can find me online at drmarisol.com. So that's www.drdrmarisol.com, as well as on Instagram at the queen at queen of the thrones, as well as on Facebook under the same handle as well too. So I hope to see everybody. And I especially would love to invite you all to come join me on Sunday nights for the pearls of practice at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific time. It's a wonderful event very, very nice, soulful talk all and where I pass down all the pearls that I've learned in my practice. Awesome. Well, you guys stay tuned. We have another episode coming up in just a minute. Bye-bye for now.